Ariel, a young Jewish man, is preparing to leave for Buenos Aires when he receives a call from his father, Usher. As is obvious from the conversation, Ariel is about to fly miles to introduce his girlfriend to the family, but the couple won't fly down there together. As it turns out, Monica will stay in New York for one more week to do some auditions with a choreographer from Eastern Europe. Usher is surprised. His son is finally visiting to introduce his girlfriend, and the girlfriend herself isn't coming. Anyhow, at the end of the conversation, Usher asks Ariel to buy a pair of Velcro sneakers for a boy who's in the hospital and needs them. It is already kind of late for him to request such a thing, but since it's an emergency, Ariel will still try. Being on a very tight schedule, Ariel strolls the New York streets at a high pace, but to no avail. He spends so much time trying to do this favor that he is forced to change plans for today. Before going to the airport, he had to see Monica, but thanks to this unexpected task, he will have to head straight to the airport in the next scene. When the girl finds out about it over the phone, she gets mad, thinking that it's Ariel's childish punishment for not going with him to Buenos Aires today. She hangs up on him. As Velcro sneakers keep hiding from the man, Ariel starts to get drawn by the memories that await him in the Jewish neighborhood of Buenos Aires. Based on the memory that is shown in the next scene, we can surely say that Ariel is much like his dad in many aspects. Most importantly, he has a tendency to enjoy the preparation process more than the result. This memory, however, isn't this meaningful because of this single aspect. Here, Usher receives a call from a neighbor who asks him to help out in a funeral procession. The man doesn't know who the neighbor is, he doesn't even ask. This is the dilemma he is facing. He can either help this stranger out, or go on a flag day together with his son. Ariel's future seems somewhat dependent on his decision. Once in Buenos Aires, the present time Ariel is picked up by Hercules, his father's good friend. As he says, Usher was taking care of some business and couldn't come to meet him at the airport. Hercules is just as surprised by Monica's not being here as his good friend. He appears to be a man of tradition, painting a picture of Ariel and Monica's relationship that none of the young ones would attest to. After a fair bit of wandering, Ariel finally gets to a place where he expects to meet his father. Seeing his aunt, Susie, he cuts an enormous line of people, trying to get inside the foundation building, and hands her the shoes that he bought. As it turns out, he couldn't get the exact thing that was requested. The size is correct, but the sneakers aren't Velcro. There is major chaos inside the foundation office, which appears to store almost everything. In a separate room that looks like an office, Ariel sees a girl he doesn't know. Her name is Eva and she will be important for the story that is about to quicken its pace. As the confused Ariel continues to look around and be lost in this orderly chaos, Susie gives him another task. According to this sudden quest, the young man will have to go to some old Goldstain's apartment and check if there is something left in his drawers and in his medicine cabinet. Confused and a little bit bitter that his family is giving him such a cold welcome, Ariel tries to calm his nerves down and hits the streets of Buenos Aires with this unusually quiet stranger. Indeed, Eva remains absolutely silent throughout the entire way. Usher's name is sounding everywhere around the building where the old Goldstein's apartment is. The Jewish community seems to be extremely tight. Once the duo enters the place, Eva opens up the windows, lets in some air and light, and begins cleaning up. After a couple of seconds, Ariel finally starts to help out. The old man seems to have recently passed away, and now this unexpectedly paired-up duo are the ones collecting his things. Usher calls once more and urges his son to take everything that could still be used. He also admits that he cannot meet his son today. What his occupation is, we do not yet know. One more important thing happens in this conversation. Usher tells his son to take Goldstein's phone. He still must have his monthly plan, and it is hard to acquire. The young one will avoid a lot of headaches if he just takes it. It's nobody now. Before exiting the apartment, Ariel follows this advice, proving that owning an object is a consumerist myth that is being told to users all over the world. Entering his childhood home that evening, Ariel observes the atmosphere quietly. The next morning, after sleeping on a couch, even though all the beds are free, he returns to his old habit of eating crackers with caramel. Preparing each bite carefully, he speaks with Monica over the phone and learns that the woman doesn't want to do the audition anymore. Even more surprising, she wants to quit dancing entirely. The reason behind this, and the results that will follow, are interesting. But this line of conversation is cut short before more can be said. The girl suddenly gets interested in where Ariel's father is. It is unusual that he still hasn't seen his son after so many years. That morning, after going to his aunt's once more, the young man finds himself speaking with Usher on the phone. Again, another task is presented to him, 
and this time he tries to turn it down. There is no use in trying, though. The quest is to bring the shoes he bought to the patient, along with some other things that he needs. There are quite a few lists of necessities, so Ariel has to note them down before leaving to fulfill the assignment. Taking Hercules' beat-up old car, he drives to the hospital in the next scene and asks for a patient named Marcelo Cohen. Once we are introduced to the patient, we learn that the boy is quite arrogant. He takes everything that is brought to him by this generous stranger for granted and spares only complaints, especially about the lace shoes. Interestingly, he seems to have been refusing to shower for a very long time, to the point that the nurses are beginning to be annoyed. Once a phone rings in the room, the young boy indicates to Ariel to answer it in his place, and the man, who has already gotten quite used to following requests, takes it and starts speaking. It turns out to be his father on the other end of the line, and since the old man gets a chance to speak with his son once more, he gives him some other tasks for the day. The final task that Ariel should carry out is to check on the mute girl, Eva, and see if there's anything she needs. She seems to be a wonderful person, and she deserves some attention. Later that evening, Ariel spends some time with this wordless woman in the Foundation building. She seems to be living on the poorly arranged second floor, where she prepares delectable meals every day. This time, too, she is making a dish Ariel's mother used to make, so the young man finds himself under the sudden attack of a strong appetite. The smell, coupled with Eva's silence, gives him another kind of appetite too that is, appetite to talk. Heedlessly, he speaks of many things, until he finds himself sharing details of his relationship with Eva as well. As it turns out, the young man isn't very satisfied with his current situation with Monica. The connection is slowly fading, and sadly, even the couple's conversations are beginning to become hollow and soulless. Naturally, since Eva never speaks up, Ariel doesn't learn what a possible solution might be to his problem, but sharing part of his burden still lightens his mind and gives him a glimpse of satisfaction. Finally, he asks Eva about her personal life too, but the girl seems oddly dissatisfied about it. In the next scene, Ariel is woken up by a ringing on his door. It is expected that finally Usher will be introduced, but it turns out to be a butcher at the door, looking for a boy. The man seems to be quite annoyed with Usher. He is definitely here to seek a fight, so seeing his young son, he immerses himself in a variety of insults. The butcher says that he won't follow Usher's requests, and will give him his meat only if he decides to drop by his shop. While spitting out insults, he mentions Ariel's mother, who once ran away as well. This infuriates the young man as well. Opening the door, he spreads his shoulders and meets this mountain of a man with courage. Protecting the name of his mother, he says that he doesn't blame her at all, and deserves even a glimpse of respect from the huge man. The butcher doesn't fight back. He turns around and leaves him. Thanks to this unknown incident between the butcher and usher, there is no meat in the foundation for the poor. The meat problem is quite important, however, so it isn't long until Ariel receives another call from usher and another task to go down to the butcher to sort out this matter once and for all. Walking in the street, Ariel is told that the butcher is Eva's father. He refuses to give meat to the foundation because, after Eva stormed out of his house, she was sheltered by the foundation. While helping in the office, she seems to have met some boys as well. And this is the person the butcher was looking for this morning. As advised, Ariel puts on a tie to elicit some respect in the enormous man, and dives headfirst into an economic conversation with a man who has no intention to participate in such a contact. Even before the young man manages to make some sensible points, the butcher's mind is already well made up. He won't give meat to Usher's foundation, and there are no words that are going to make him do so. Returning the money that was given to him, he finishes up the conversation and returns to his job. That evening, Ariel goes through some stuff in his old house, and drawn by his memories, immerses himself in his childhood. Looking through the pictures of his family and the things that were once very important to him, he comes across a rosette pin that he used to wear on his chest during the carnival. This single, very simple, and worn-out piece holds an incredible amount of importance to the young man, since it is a part of one of his core memories that we have already seen. Once Ariel is done swimming in the river of his memories, he leaves a voicemail to his father and tells him that he will no longer be staying in his apartment. He shares how things went with the butcher as well. Ariel prepares to leave then, but before he can manage to walk out of the door, Susie comes in unexpectedly. She seems to have arrived for a regular cleanup. It isn't long after that she learns about Ariel's decision to leave and his reasons for doing so. Justifying Usher, she emphasizes just how longingly he has waited for this day. No matter what she says, however, Ariel still prefers to leave. He tries to leave the keys with Susie, but as it turns out, he will have to drop them off with Eva. 
She is in charge of the keys. On his way towards the foundation in the next scene, Monica gives him a call. As always, he has little motivation to speak with her. But even if he wanted it, he couldn't. There is no reception in the city. Walking with a stretched out hand, he strolls the streets until he reaches the foundation office and finally catches some bars. Seeing Eva in the window frame, all motivation to speak with his girlfriend suddenly flies away. Eva seems to be in a great mood that night. As always, she isn't speaking, but her willingness to communicate with Ariel is obvious in her expressions. After pouring some wine for both of them, she even manages to laugh. And for the first time, Ariel gets to hear her voice. Here, the young man learns that Eva simply chooses not to speak. She has nothing to say. Once Ariel thinks that she's living this kind of lifestyle only for religious purposes, he immerses himself in a long monologue about his own view of the matter. As it turns out, he no longer believes that there is one omnipotent being looking over the world. This belief, or anti-belief, is a result of one of his core memories, and for some reason, he thinks it will be interesting for Eva to hear it. And so, expressing readiness to listen, the girl changes her pose and starts gazing at his mouth, indicating that he should get to it. As it turns out, during the flag day, after being presented with the dilemma of either going together with his son on the flag day or burying a man with nine other men, Usher chose the latter. This seems to have had such an effect on the young man that even to this day, he states that this is the sole reason for his disbelief in religion. To him, it is nothing more than an unnecessary tradition inflicted upon men. If you ask Ariel now, there was no reason for Usher to go with those men to the funeral. While his presence on the flag day would have meant the world to little Ariel, Usher did whatever he did for God. And this is why the concept of the omnipotent has been long rejected by the young man. To emphasize that she understands his frustration, Eva smiles. She keeps smiling, even when Ariel expresses his will to give her the pin. As he leans over to attach it to her chest, the duo have their first moment of silent intimacy. In this moment, a subtle bond is created, and it is an ironic coincidence that this is exactly when Monica calls Ariel again. As he shows no interest in standing up and answering, Eva suddenly decides to become playful. Standing up, she steals the phone and runs away. The girl has a lot of fun, but the same cannot be said of the poor young man. On Thursday, four days before Monica's arrival, Ariel walks around the city while on the phone with her, allowing her to take a look at the places that hold enormous meaning to him. He walks around with his mobile camera looking outward, telling the stories that are connected to each place. Suddenly, over his unending sentences, we hear Monica saying that she has something very important to share. It takes quite a long time before Ariel hears it as well, and shows readiness to listen to her. Afterwards, he will wish not to have listened at all. But at this point, he has no idea that some very frustrating news is awaiting him. As it turns out, the girl's plans have been changed once more. She seems to have been chosen by a very important man named Valak as a new member of his choreography group. And now she has to stay in New York indefinitely. To add to Ariel's anxiety, she emphasizes that Valak took her in his hands and threw her out, as an indication that he has chosen her over others. Naturally, frustration, stress, anger, and all his insecurities turn back on Ariel immediately. It is clear that the girl he's been in a relationship with for so long has no intention to look at things from his perspective. Surely, there must be a way for her to somehow make time, since it is so important for Ariel, but Monica obviously prefers doing other stuff. The addition of another man to the picture causes that much more pain for the young man, but he still has no idea that this is just the beginning. Soon, before he can manage to let all his anger out of his system, both his phone and his suitcase are stolen from him in the streets. At a high pace, he tramps the pavement, but to no avail. People indicate to him the possible whereabouts of the thief, but in this mess of a city, there is no way for Ariel to find the things that were stolen from him. Suddenly, drowning hopelessly in his desperation, Ariel hears his name and turns to see his old friend standing at the entrance of a shop. His name is Lucho, and he embraces his old friend warmly. Ariel, who has no other choice, is forced to enter the shop and play the role of a friend who's happy about this fateful coincidence. It is comical to see the contrast between these two individuals. Lucho is settled down and happy. Taking care of his father's old business, he has everything figured out. With no financial or relationship problems, his life works like clockwork. He has children and a wife who are just as happy as he is, and it is all thanks to tradition. Once, he wanted to run away from this swamp of a city, but now he realizes that he made the right decision by staying and following the path that was well prepared for him. While talking with him about the business, Ariel finds himself feeling much better. Perhaps he should follow his father's path too. That night, 
Upon approaching the foundation building, Ariel sees Eva closing up and leaving the building. Following her stealthily, he finds himself in a church. Immediately and comically, he is swarmed by men and taken away to a changing room, where, for the first time, he is given a tefillin. The young man doesn't complain about anything. Surrendering himself fully to this group, he keeps silent until tefillin is both on his arm and on his head. It cannot be said with full confidence that Ariel finds himself within this group, but it's still evident that the young man doesn't hate being around this. It can also be said that, to some degree, he enjoys being the center of attention. Soon, after numerical religious concepts are explained to him quite energetically, he expresses just how much he needs to pee. It isn't long after that that he is let go. Wandering around the building in search of a bathroom, he suddenly comes across a room filled with a sapphire like blue light. Peeping inside, he sees a Eva, preparing herself for a mikveh, a cleansing ritual conducted before praying. The young man is petrified. Knowing perfectly well that whatever he is doing isn't justified, he fails to pull himself away from this one spot. His eyes are well locked in one position when suddenly one of the group members finds him and takes him to another bath, which is filled with much less desirable bodies. On Friday morning, Ariel seems to be a different man. Approaching the regular commotion at the foot of the foundation building, he decides to take care of it. In front of the frustrated poor, he announces himself with a lengthy monologue about how they are going to take care of the meat problem and even manages to calm them down. After he is done speaking, the group of restless citizens scatter away and leave the office alone. The change is evident when Ariel enters the building as well. Once, he wouldn't care about the Foundation's affairs at all, but now he views this business as his own. Up until this point, we haven't taken a glance at Usher, but it is highly possible that this is exactly how he acts when he is around. Ariel is beginning to immerse himself in the life of this Jewish neighborhood, and just like his father, he is taking on the role of a leader. Entering the main office, he refuses to answer Usher on the phone when an unusual case shows itself to him. A young and very talented gay man appears in his office, asking him for help with a quite difficult task. He wants to find a rabbi who will conduct bar mitzvah on him. When he was 13, he arrived at his ceremony in a girl's attire, and because of that, his bar mitzvah was cancelled immediately. As he says, his father never saw him again, and his mother sadly passed away. Ariel who clearly holds contemporary views about this matter, listens to him empathetically and with a helping attitude. Immediately after hearing him out, he starts looking for a rabbi who owes the foundation a favor. The plan is devised very quickly, and Susie is sent to take care of the rest of the matter. The boy is extremely grateful. That evening, after taking part in the Sabbath ritual, Eva and Ariel face one another in silence. The holy business is all taken care of now, so they feel free to do whatever they want. Dashing towards one another unexpectedly, they entangle with each other and share their first kiss. The next morning, Ariel finally gets to hear her talk about herself. He finds a lot about her in this dialogue. Specifically, she doesn't seem to have as much belief, as is seen from the outside. She has her doubts, and sometimes even thinks that nobody's looking down on humanity at all. Once this matter is closed, the subject of their conversation changes, and they start speaking about his father and the boy he is trying to catch. Ariel also wants to know how Usher is involved in this story. Eva begins clearing things up by saying something extremely unexpected. As it turns out, she is pregnant. The father of the baby which she's carrying is the boy he met at the hospital. Immediately after learning that Eva is pregnant, he seems to have run away, and Mamian, Eva's father, started going after him. It seems Usher is the one giving this boy no shelter. Hiding him from Mamian, he kept him for a couple of days and then sent him to Israel where he could continue living free. Ariel is petrified by this news. He seems to be angry at his father for helping a man who would run away like that. But Eva is glad that Usher did it. The boy is nobody, and with Usher's help, he flew without a drop of blood, which is a good thing. Ariel manages to keep his reaction smooth for now, but in the next scene, when he finally hits the streets, he turns off his internal control system and lets his anger out. That evening, he receives a call from Usher and learns some sudden news from him. Mamun, Eva's father, is deceased, and thus the meat problem no longer exists. Usher wants him to stop by a soup kitchen and take care of some business for him. Ariel doesn't fight back. Before Usher even finishes up his sentence, he hangs up and gets to work. In the next scene, he spends some time with his community in the soup kitchen. There can no longer be any doubt that he has found his place in this culture. It is delightful to see him immersing himself in this tight Jewish community. That day, he takes part in rituals all on his own, 
and even visits the arrogant boy in the hospital. He brings him fresh and soft towels, and in turn, he learns a lot more about this young man. As it turns out, tomorrow, a very serious head surgery will be conducted on him. Marcelo isn't very nervous, however. On the contrary, he is excited for the future. Once he is out of the hospital, he plans to go to the synagogue and participate in opening it. As it seems, he is much needed for the synagogue opening because of the Minyan tradition. According to the rules that are part of that tradition, there must be 10 men in the community if they want to conduct a public prayer. At this time, there are only nine in Marcelo's community, so he needs to be out there so that the synagogue can be opened. Ariel is very intrigued by this tradition. This concept of Minyan is exactly why Usher once chose a funeral over his son. The young man explains the concept quite poorly. He says that the roots of this tradition lie in the story of Moses. But the reason why the number 10 is so important in the eyes of the omnipotent God is still left unexplained. As Marcelo concludes, some concepts are so self-evident that questioning them is a huge folly. The next day, the Jewish community celebrates Purim. As the meat is finally distributed among the poor, Ariel finally gets to see the face of his father. Usher's introduction is as ordinary as ever. He meets his son as if he's been seeing him every day. Together, the father and the son get a large piece of meat from Hercules' car and take it inside the foundation building. After jamming it in a small freezer, they sit on top of it and dive head deep into the silence that falls. Usher chooses not to show how happy he is to see his son, even then. As he takes out a cigarette, his phone rings. Clearly, Usher has no intention to answer this number, so Ariel does it in his place. As it is told to him, there are only nine men at Mamian's funeral. The entire story is wrapped up, and Ariel's personal development is clearly shown as he decides to be the tenth man. And so, the young man forgets all about New York. Reconnecting with his roots, he now knows exactly what he wants from life.